Hello everyone, today we talk about the Merovingian dynasty. Uh, I've been basically the only person on YouTube making videos about this topic, I remember, since the first years, and still there is not much else out there, <laughs> I've seen that, I'm getting views with that, and I also realized that I never made a uh, basic, let's say, video about, a manualistic video about the Merovingians in general, it was always like the Merovingians and or you know, about something else, right, and as some aspect of their story, etc. So I would like to make something more general, but at the same time more uh, more substantial relative to, to this uh, ruling family of the Franks. It's important to stress properly as the two different things, right? The Merovingians were a dynasty, which is something that in, in Germanic history you, you hardly see at this point, and in fact that they changed uh, a big deal all over Europe in a, in a completely different way um, compared to what had been the Germanic tradition but also the Roman one at that point. Naturally uh, a lot of Romanization was involved not just because of the sedentarization and having a base of power fundamentally uh, in Gaul, rather, aside from the fact that Francia Frank yes, stretched know up to the, the Rhine fundamentally and uh, but the Neustria fundamentally was the, the the place where the monarchy was accomplished properly and uh, we'll, as we will see now uh, and um, that emerged fundamentally as the uh, greatest power in, uh, in Western Europe after the breaking up of the Empire of Theodoric the Great we made also videos about the Ostrogoths and the broader international relevance of the axis constituted, let's say, by uh, the, the Goths and other essentially Aryan peoples, or sometimes even pagan, like including the ones of, of, of Germany properly. Uh, and the uh, Catholic one, represented by the Merovingians and the Roman Empire, Constantinople, and eventually the, or the, the first axis broke uh, through you know, mostly the Justinian and Reconquest, in part, however, was aimed at stemming, we made a video about this, the countering the Franks uh, and the Merovingians properly, the, an, an Atlantic perspective, meaning that the uh, that Justinian would have properly thought of how to create um, a barrier with the Franks and uh, that, you know, because of the arrival of the Longobards, fundamentally would have been separated and thus actually allied against a common enemy with, with the Byzantines uh, for, for a couple of centuries. Uh, but fundamentally, with the Carolingian conquest of, of the Longobards, uh, what we see there as fundamentally the Western Empire and the Eastern Empire and their attrition in the in the peninsula, also in say uh, the the out northwestern outskirts of the Balkans, etc., um, in the Mediterranean, uh, broadly meant would would be more evident at some point, and from there all uh, a pattern that developed further with the Holy Roman Empire and so on. But as we made as we explained also in other videos, fundamentally the Merovingians are a bit the overlooked power in, in Europe at this, uh, I would say in popular culture at this point in history, uh, which is understandable from one side because of today's, let's say, political, national, you know, prevalences, perspectives and so on, uh, but also because we are not very documented, right, on an early medieval reality. It doesn't matter how big it was and how much, you know, it produced also in terms of sources, objectively. Um, and also for another reason, that is to say, the um, the damnatio memoria, in part, that the Carolingians made of the same Merovingians to fundamentally aggrandize themselves ideologically, etc. And uh, it, fascinatingly enough, this was a practice that they had inherited from the same Merovingians, right? And uh, together with much else about the, fe the feature of their their own monarchy and uh, their own sacrality that is often also announced at some levels historiographical, but it's really not so. The Merovingians engineered uh, and probably the single greatest ideological, um, uh, let's say, me royal mythology uh, in um, in the history of of Europe. Right, there is no doubt about this. Other dynasties 
uh, acquired fame, you know, relevance, um, you know, some symbological, uh, let's say, characteristic for for their importance, for for you know the, the, what they achieved, and also the length of their um, of their existence, etc. But Merovingians consistently transformed properly what we know as the West in ways that are dramatically overlooked. So it's important to talk about them and to try to understand better the nature of their power and seeing how much of what we also historiographically has been attributed to the Carolingians was actually already there uh, and also uh, how much the same Merovingians of course inherited from especially the Gallo-Roman tradition that is the one in which they solidly built their their Catholic power as uh, preferential allies of the papacy way before Carolingian times uh, and also developing properly a church and a mystics of, of, of monarchy as we were saying before that were really impressive and constituted um, an element on its own but their history is complex as complex was the nature of their domination here um, sometimes I use the term Merovingian kingdom because objectively there was a king of the Franks, stretching over essentially the Neustria and Austrasia, the two parts of Francia. Of Francia. Um, and, but the, the Franks, uh, man, the Merovingians, manifested immediately uh, um, an imperialistic orientation, so much that they subdued all these peoples around the Aquitanians, the Burgundians, the Alamanni, the Bavarians, eventually, you know, the Carolingians completed the work further. Um, and that, that, you know, was a system that actually remained intact as in spite of fundamentally the fragmentation of the same monarchy in four distinct kingdoms at the end of the uh, of the seventh century for which this power at that point didn't quite exist as such anymore and in fact that's how um, you know that the, the, the Carolingians would go on reconstituting the same and also inheriting all what we've seen before about them so uh, we also made videos on key figures such as Clovis that we will not have the time today to just to, to focus on so you can I, I have a Frankish history and a Merovingian history playlist so if you're interested um, uh, you know it's all there I'm re-uploading a lot of stuff currently but um, it's it's all uh, available uh, for watch and we will naturally also keep talking uh, about them so um, the the Merovingians appear as kings of the Franks in, in the Roman army of northern Gaul already before before times, as they were essentially these regis, these multiple kings that emerged here and there in, among the Frankish people. That, as you know, was a confederation of uh, previous Germanic tribes, of the essentially northwestern Germany, um, a bit like the protagonists of what had been the the, the battle of Teutoburg Force back in the day, with all the things that surely had passed, you know, in, in the mean, you know, in, in, in half of a millennium between the thing. Um, we don't have to think they were particularly Romanized. This is a common mistake that is done. Uh, sometimes I get this from, from the audience also because they think that since the Merovingians became Catholic and they ruled through the, the ecclesiastical elites and so on, uh, the Franks were more Romanized than other people. This is absolutely wrong. It's a complete misconception that has no ground. The Franks had literally come out of the forest just a, a few, you know, <laughs> uh, generations before. Um, they had surely, as many Ger many other Germans, including some that lived, I don't know, up to, I don't know, the Jutland or even beyond that, had participated, had, mm, had served in the Roman army as faithful Roman soldiers, by the way, and they had acquired surely a, a knowledge and understanding of you know what Roman civilization was, and this is true for all the essentially semi sedentary people that lived at the, the outskirts of the Roman Empire, and um, there were naturally games of power internationally for which certain peoples sided more with the Romans, others with I don't know with the Huns, but at least in, in, back in the day. The situation was more fragmented even within this, this, what we think is the same confederacies that, as a matter of fact, didn't count as, identically speaking, for them as much as their, their own relative tribe or even clan was at some point. Um, and uh, while it is true that this um, Frankish chieftains had gradually expanded in you know, the Rhineland and you know, further in the Gallia Belgica and so on, uh, under Roman, you know, by, by Roman fedus essentially, as, as federati. And those areas were 
um, had had mm, declined or had de deteriorated rapidly in, in, in demographically, economically. They were not so Romanized to present, let's say, such you know. But we know that also by lifestyle. Yes, of course, there was there, there were cities, there was um, a road network, there was a constant contact with the Romans, etc. But so the, there is a, a, a component of Romanization. But the Franks were not as Romanized as the Goths, famously enough, um, um, and the the, their, the let's say Gallia Belgica had been essentially a militarized province that the Romans actually put a lot of care in administering infrastructurally the, the, the Franks actually took uh, took great advantage of that right? especially these great um, uh, estates that were used properly to supply the legions and the Rhine frontier that eventually passed in the hands of these now Romano-Germanic Gallic lords right in, in, in Merovingian times uh, intact because Gaul hadn't been fundamentally destroyed like but had happened to would happen actually at this point with the Gothic War in Italy of that otherwise was still Roman. The saying goes a bit like for, for the Visigoths, where Spain was a sort of proto vassalatic system like in Gaul. They still because before the uh, the Arab conquest, because that's fundamentally also another land that hadn't been raised uh, like or completely reworked on the, in terms of land property etc like Britain for example as well um, so there was a, an enormous continuity it is true with um, between Roman and Merovingian Gaul but for for the simple reason that Gaul was fundamentally a, a a Gallo-Roman reality, right, of which the Merovingians, and this is important, not much the Franks themselves, they surely migrated, especially in the more depopulated north, as we will see now, as properly an ethnic component of some relevance different from most areas where the Germans settled, which they were an overwhelming um, minority from a numerical point of view. Uh, so much, that, but still, you know, however, the Languedoc is definitely very different from the Languedoc, but still, it's 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 a Romance language even in the north of Gaul, um, of what would become France properly, and um, the um, so uh, the the idea here is the work of elite that was accomplished fundamentally by by Clovis that literally beheaded all the other Frankish chieftains and subdued basically all the, the free Franks that also traditionally held, as the name says, at least hypothetically, properly, this stressing this idea, like the Alamanni too, you know, this idea of, of egalitarianism in a sense. It was uh, anti-monarchic in, in the deepest, deep, most deeply rooted Germanic tradition. And instead, the Merovingians completely destroyed to create a, a monarchy and a dynasty and a sacral nature of the same that basically was to rule over um, a highly stratified, reality like the uh, Gallo-Roman one uh, already was, right? So much of uh, Frankish feudalism, as later on, the, the Vassalatic Beneficiary System, wait videos about the Commendats, etc., date back to, to, to the Roman Latifundum, right? And even before, maybe even in Gallic times, because frankly, uh, by the time of, uh, of Caesar, the Gauls had, were, were a proto-feudal society with you know a very few rich landlords and essentially and all the rest of the people already turned into serfs not into freemen anymore so there's a long deeply rooted tradition of of aristocratic uh, nature in in Gaul that leaped on and fueled the same Merovingian uh, policy that was essentially ruling thanks to the support of these elements that in fact will be uh, at the bur uh, at the base of feudal Europe, properly as the idea of 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 lords that are technically free and that, however, just agree every once in a while to to have a a leader, a recognized one that still has to be very careful about managing the whole system without imbalance, etc. But that still maintains that elite co-ops it and manages to to control through it an extensive amount of land. This is very new historically. Right, because the, the Roman system was still framed within a statal reality, and here instead, state had collapsed. And therefore, all that remained were these clientels and such um, connections that were fundamentally devoid of a, of a public nature, especially among the Franks. As we will see, there is some historiographical controversy about this interpretation too, but I'm, I'm actually very much in favor 
uh, of the concept. And thanks to such clientels and the you know available resources of Gaul, the, the enormous and very fertile Atlantic plains, northwestern Europe, the Merovingians managed to create literally an empire. Right, they conquered most of Gaul. They defeated the Visigoths in 507, basically seizing uh, all Aquitaine and reducing down to the land strip in southwestern Mediterranean Septimania. Um, the the Burgundians in 534. Uh, they also extend. They had defeated the Alamanni as well before, as we will see, um, and uh, they they extended their rule in Rezia in 537. Thus, so the Alamanni, the Bavari, the Saxons, eventually accepted their lordship in a way or another. Also, the Anglo-Saxons uh, across the Channel were fundamentally Merovingian clients, um, and Frankish influence deeply contributed in developing also Anglo-Saxon. Uh, monarchy and uh, monarchic models and um, the Merovingian realm was thus the largest and most powerful of the states of Western Europe um, after the um, the breaking up of the Gothic uh, axis with the essentially the death of Theodoric the Great um, there would be a lot to say also in this international perspective how much you know relations had been you know say complex uh, and uh, the, the various interests, the various fluctuations and instability of these Romano-Germanic kingdoms that had brought to this. But the the Franks were definitely the new force, right? The one that could, as we've seen, create problems also and compete uh, with with the with the Byzantine Empire in, in controlling same Europe and. Um, even though they were much of a terrestrial power, still having an influence on Mediterranean areas, right? And um, there is there is a world you can ideally trace here, a barrier where the, the most Romanized lands were out of the reach of the Frankish world. That is, the Frankish world properly stopped in the uh, to those areas that were, um, you know, uh, more more Romanized, more deeply Romanized than the Franks were, and that. You know that they exercised um, over lordship, but you know the centralized fashion. Uh, nevertheless, it's it's meaningful still that, especially from the Atlantic watershed, this domination was fundamentally hegemonic, right? And was no other competitor, right? The, the, the Germanic tribes being too, you know, too loose to to present any meaningful threat um, to the to, to the to the kingdom in in itself. Uh, this, the, the Romano-Germanic uh, smaller entities like uh, like the Aquitanians, the Burgundians, etc., were also being too too weak individually to to cope with the Franks. That had, in this regard, it's important to stress, thanks to those, to, to those estates that were held by in single individuals. In this sense, mm, as we have seen, uh, preluding to the to the vassalatic beneficiary system, they had already a semi-professional military right way before the Carolingians, like intense like kind of accelerated further but still you know in a very gradual way for, for in our times you know yeah measurement um would would render it kind of even more 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 solid now the dynastic name of the merovingians comes from the medieval latin merovingian merovingi so sons of meroic um and it derives from an attested frankish form akin to the attested old english merovioving uh, and with the final ing being a typical Germanic patronymic suffix, and and the name comes from the uh, the king, uh, the first king Merovech, right? Fundamentally, uh, a legendary figure who we'll see in a while. And there is debate, rel given his, as we'll see, his fundamentally heroic nature, his um, semi-divine uh, origin. Uh, he, um, you know, it has been thought that, that the Merovingians. Uh, Attached already to to such genealogy of dating back to to a sea monster, etc. Uh, um, you know, some kind of sacral nature, right? And there is a debate in this because uh, the Merovingians didn't quite state this specifically. Also, it would have been unlikely to do uh, at the time they they reached power as they were fundamentally Christians, in spite of the you know the the, the pagan relics that still you know existed. Like we know that Christian Franks still practiced pagan human sacrifices by the 7th century. So uh, that's those are the Franks, right? <laughs> if, you, if you want to recognize them, that's fundamentally it. They, there is properly a, a, a term attached to the Merovingians, that there is uh, emetophilia, 
right? I made a video some time ago about the sacralization of the Merovingian monarchy that fundamentally revolved about the, the sacred nature of, um, of of the you know properly of, of the of the mission of which the, the the dynasty was invested. The Merovingians basically took every single ideological uh, tool possible to aggrandize their own power, right? And much of this was connected naturally with the Christian passion, the sufferings of Christ's death, the newly converted, uh, bloody, uh, ethically speaking, pagans. So you know the the the, the most vile, you know, I admired the most violent aspects of this is a uh, you know something that the Franks would maintain for a long time. Charlemagne, the, the Carolingians were, for example, much more easily, much more um, Jewish in nature than. Than, than Christian, in, in considering their literal obsession with the military content of the Old Testament, they craved for blood. There is a properly an insistence in their uh, in their in their monarchic ideology for blood, because this is not just a warlike people, but it's also a dynasty. So, as we will see, also the pros and cons, the double-edged sword that you know represented from a political institutional point of view the fortune, in fact, the uh, the the fall of saying Merovingians and leaving further actually is the fact that the, the they rent they considered themselves as fundamentally a, a chosen uh, people right remember always uh, after the jews and the romans the franks were the people in history that believed the most in the fact that they were the chosen people not a chosen the chosen people and this should never be underestimated from a moral point of view, because objectively they achieved something that without that mentality could have hardly been, been done, right? And even though the sacralization, you know, the, the Ger German paganism, uh, especially during the migration era, had, you know, boosted, the, let's say the elites had tried to, to stress their own sacrality in order to emerge from this war from, from which freemen, that is, read still, are lesser aristocracies, you know, checked continuously the uh, for to, in order to avoid the, the rise of, of, of individual kings, essentially because they wanted to act as kinglets on their own, with their own business. Um, and um, the Merovingians, as we've seen, break completely with tradition. Actually, it was the Goths under, however, Roman mediation that were me able to properly have, to create a monarchy on their own. You can argue that the Gallo-Romans did a bit the same thing with the Merovingians themselves, uh, but the Merovingians went much further than the Goths had, uh, um, you know, had managed at least to, to accomplish. Um, concretely, and um, at least because they were the largest power, right, and with the, the largest monarchic power that had nothing to be, uh, the, the Clovis was clever to, to, as we've seen, literally take out all the other uh, noble competitors, and, uh, you know, the Ostrogoths, especially the, the Visigoths, actually, were instead always in turmoil, because they would always, you know, there was no it was very difficult to actually control the whole establishment event that that the the whole the whole um, aristocracy that eventually would take over the monarchy on the long run uh here uh, the the system called in, in francia the system collapsed be, b in the sense as unitarily speaking but ideologically wouldn't it was always the same merovingians that kill each other um on a regular basis in the single most radically violent ways that in a dynasty has ever happened literally we're talking about children put their brains smashed on rocks literally because they were sons they had the blood of the merovingians and therefore they the various brothers had to knock each other out this is not to be seen in any other romano germanic kingdom exactly because of the dynastic nature of merovingian power and in any case, their sacralization is somewhat evident. The monarchy was sacred. This is something that lived on in the same, um, you know, political mystics of France. Uh, and um, and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss later um, as well, because there is definitely a connection. It was nothing teleological between the Franks and the emergence of France, but still there is a, a connection, and it is impo very important to, 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 to see it, especially in the ideological link um, and think about the taumaturgic power of kings and or properly their the the, the magic power for, for example the long hair the merovingians were distinguished them um, among the franks who uh, commonly cut their hair short and in fact the the contemporaries referred um, to the merovingians as to the 
uh, Regis Criniti, which in Latin means long-haired kings. And a Merovingian whose hair was cut could not rule, right? And a rival could be removed from the succession by being tonsured and sent to a monastery. This is the important connection. This actually was present in um, also in other Germanic realities, like the idea, but not and not only the idea that the the power uh, of a man stood within his uh, his, his hair, right? And um, there was, however, here properly a sacralization of the of the individual as such, and the uh, the, the the necessary fitness that derived uh, from it for for in order to rule. Um, the Merovingians also used a distinct name stock. For example, Clovis uh, uh, evolved into was one of the most common ones, evolved into Louis, uh, and it remained common among the French royalty down to the 19th century, and you know also one famous Western name in general. Um, the first known Merovingian king was, I mean, historically Kilderic the first died in 481. So um, you understand we are, as we'll see, at the collapse of um, essentially the of, of, of Roman rule in Gaul. His son Clovis the first died in 511. Was the one who made the big step, converted to Christianity, to the Nicene Creed, right? Not to Arianism like the uh, basically all the other Franks had done, right? They switched. Uh, they were the only ones to switch directly from paganism to Catholicism without to, to orthodoxy properly that mean fundamentally the same at this point uh, and uh, in, in ecclesiastical history and and this naturally for appeasing the, the Gallo-Roman uh, elites um, and he was the one that in fact thus succeeded in uniting the Franks or just you know controlling all the Franks and conquering most of Gaul. So the Merovi the we will we made also a video about the Merovingian army. We will explain here how they made it, meaning what were their resources, how eventually you know the, the Roman administration died out, but st still the Merovingians managed to exploit it in order to to conquer all these areas, to having a dramatic strategic projection capabilities, um, and so on. Now, the Merovingians treated their kingdom as a, uh, as single yet divisible, as we've seen. This is very important because uh, the kingdom was theoretically the one of the Franks, but factually it was a personal property of the Merovingian dynasty. And as such, uh, therefore, they, uh, in maintaining the Germanic habit of splitting uh, equally the um, father's inheritance among the, the, uh, the, the, um, the male sons, uh, the Merovingians... A bit exactly like the Carolingians went on essentially breaking and recomposing their kingdom over and over again through constant uh, uh, fratricide wars fundamentally. Um, Clovis' four sons divided the kingdom between them and it remained divided with the exception of four short periods that are essentially 558, 61, 16, uh, 613, 23, 629, 34, 630, uh, 73, excuse me, uh, 75 down to 679 and uh, after that it was only divided again once uh, 717 718 following uh, a coherent actually um, mm, let's say territorial pattern meaning that at this point um, in spite of the development of the clientels etc there was still you know the, the original districts that were you know from Roman um, you know, uh, for Roman administration to remain, uh, in, you know, living on as main divisions, also on the base of naturally how, how the peoples had sedentarized, but also on the previous levels of Romanization. For example, these chunks were fundamentally Austrasia, Neustria, Burgundy, and Aquitaine, right? So uh, the, the more German area of, of Francia, the most Roman era of Francia, then essentially this era where the, the Burgundians had been settled or their remains, let's say, by, by the Romans um, after having been the, crushed and deported from the Rhine. And Aquitaine, that was historically essentially like a, another country com uh, within Gaul and that the had been uh, previously settled by the Visigoths that, however, after Vouye, um defeat suffered the hand of the Franks, they uh, fundamentally... Uh, so recentered their 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 power in the in the Iberian plateau, 
the center of the Iberian Plateau. And the, um, the, the, the interesting aspect of this is, however, that these four kingdoms fundamentally were like, like four squares, like squared in, in, into each other, and the main political centers, the main important cities, um, uh, were uh, fundamentally all, all close right to the uh, bordering corners right so this those were the areas that eventually would be the very heart of the french kingdom itself we're talking about very important cities like paris orleans tours uh, etc but there were men others that you know here all of roman uh, tradition essentially because they they were where gold is uh, the the romans had made a, a masterpiece in gold they had fundamentally on on the base of the gallic um you know alpida and uh, com trade communication they had restructured world thing in a, a very uh, easily controllable area right go if it's like france still today like there are a f you know all these cities well let's say separated in this uh, easily you know relatively plain uh, controllable area well connected by roads um, with mm, let's say with mm, surrounding countryside that potentially makes head to the city so it was very easy to control this uh, aside from this dynastic splits that ruined the party to everybody but properly uh, this was also part of the reason why the the same strength eventually also of Frankish leadership would emerge Fundamentally te tested and re, I'd say, revived all, 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 all the time because uh, still resources, with were lots of resources available, and as long as you could channel politically uh, them into, you know, some sensible direction, that's essentially what the Carolingians do by expanding the boundaries of the empire and uh, subjugating other peoples and going on with this imperialistic, systematic. Um, uh, expansion, you, you would be able to accumulate further an enormous amount of wealth. Now, during the final century of Merovingian rule, the kings were increasingly pushed into a ceremonial role. Actual power was increasingly in the hands of the mayor of the palace, essentially the highest ranking official under the king, um, and as we'll see, this happened essentially through the, 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 the decline of same factual royal power grip on on society and their clientele so um, the 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 Merovingians were always there and they were used as a tool of legitimization from the same mayors of palace for for ruling right because that those were the sacred ones the 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 the, the royal blood right and uh, the, the fact that the Carolingians also would take so long to get rid properly of, of this of these puppets that were not even so much puppets till the very end, telling the truth, because that's also a bit the stereotype, in fact, uh, reveals how how ideologically powerful the Merovingian monarchy was. In 656, the mayor Grimald the first tried to place his son Kidelbert on the throne in Austrasia. And Grimald was arrested and executed, but his son ruled until 662, when the Merovingian dynasty was restored. When King Theodoric IV died in 737, the mayor Charles Martel continued to rule the kingdoms without a king until his death in 741. The dynasty was restored again in 743, but in 751 Charles' son, Pippin the Short, deposed the last king, Kilderic III, who seemingly was not even a Merovingian, but again, like a puppet, they had pretended to, to be so in order to, to legitimize their rule, and had himself crowned, inaugurating what we call the, the Carolingian dynasty, Pippin, its Arnulfingians, as you prefer. So, as we were saying before, the 7th century chronicle of Fredegar implies that the Merovingians were descended from a sea beast called the Kinotor. And the, the story goes like that, quote, It is said that while Claudio was uh, staying at the seaside with his wife one summer, his wife went into the sea at midday to bath, uh, to bathe, and, and a a uh, beast of Neptune, rather like a Kinotaur, found her. In the event, she was made pregnant, either by the beast or by her husband, and she gave birth to a son called Meroek, from whom the kings of the Franks have subsequently been called Merovingians. Now, all this story, uh, as we'll see, Fredegar is a later source, so it, it's also already Christianized, so it, it's naturally trying to rationalize into uh, a story that was was 
probably you know a real let's say um, t a tail within the, the the monarchic environment or or at least you know the legions that surrounded it at some level of importance and in the past uh, it's mm, yes there's been maybe an, ex an historiographical excess in pointing out as if this um, story was like uh, a you know a, a an official formal proof that the Merovingians would use to prove the sacrality of their own dynasty uh, by stressing its supernatural origin. Other scholars believe that this was just like um, an etymological explanation of why the first king was called Merovec because uh, it me literally means sea bull, right? Merovec, so it's like, oh. Uh, and um, there, however, it, it cannot be dismissed that the Merovingians actually had developed since an early age, or at least, you know, especially afterwards when they, they became factual dynasts of the Frankish people, uh, their own sacrality in a way or another. As we were saying before, the Christi see, the Christianization of the Merovingians was precocious. The one of the Franks was not, right? So the existence of um, beliefs, uh, as it's completely normal in a pagan reality that is gradually gradually because we know how that's how it happened except in christianity is to believe both things at the same time and um actually uh i believe that this still was uh that this was for real like um a story that might have been developed in an early time to properly stress the sacrality of certain uh, frankish chieftains that wanted to that had already sniffed essentially what what the the the, the opportunities in gold uh, were as we will see now how they they rose to power and to essentially leave these people lived in, in a completely mythological mindset to them um, you know as we've seen they were still very primitive especially properly the western germans were were still very you know they had been they had developed from from earlier time but they they still lived immersed in this um, in these mythologies and uh, the importance of the sea of water in general is 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 is, is crucial right not, not not much just the rhine as this major waterway that connected you know iron age germany or even before actually to the all uh, net of traffics uh, with gold with with up to the scandinavian coast etc through the uh, the the north sea etc and that even gives the name of to one chunk of the franks the ripuarian ones that were living by the river but the um the sea as well the the franks uh, were uh, here properly it's the sea in the story um but uh, the the franks were pirates um the, the the franks went on they took a bit the viking era until literum but by late roman empire like it's actually essentially as it happened with the 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 the, the carolingian crisis right it's not a cause of their fall it's it's a consequence of the collapse of a major power that lets all these pirates going away and the, and the Franks uh, toured the, the Mediterranean as pirates right so they had actually a very close connection with the sea right this is not just uh, somebody pointing out you know the Rhine no because they just were injured no these people had a clear more or less at least you know clear view of, of the fact that it was a world out there they took the sea they were inter entrepreneurial uh, aggressive of minds uh, minded they 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 lived they had seen properly the opportunity arising from these means to say okay the, 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 those great uh, chieftains that took the sea before to raid and pillage and to uh, accumulate wealth were connected were protected by divine by by maritime deities there is uh, that were connected here with the amp with the outer world right uh, the, the the frankish um, middle class would have been much more traditional much more you know uh, reactionary these these chieftains were starting to think big and they wanted to get rid of that control right this is exactly how it happened in the viking era right uh, all the vikings did was essentially destroying completely what all the traditional conventions of their own people were and to assert, to assert their own lordship in ways that were dramatically more broader and more um more more aggressive and and you know and built and developed and articulated than the ones of the, of the peoples they they, they left behind. so i believe actually in the um in the sacral touch that such mm, such myth of Merovic could have given to the early to the early merovingians now the story goes that in 486 clovis the first the son of kilderic defeated siagrus 
that the Roman military leader who competed with the Merovingians for power in northern Gaul, and he won um, eventually the Battle of Tolbiac against the Alemanni in 496, at which time, according to Gregory of Tours, uh, leading the historian of the Merovingian, uh, the early Merovingian, Clovis especially, uh, ad Clovis adopted his wife Clotilde's orthodox, that is, that is Nicene Christian fate. Right, according to the story that eventually was embellished later on, that in the battle he was losing against the Alamanni, so he prayed for the Christian God. If he had given him victory, he would have converted, and so it happened. And all the Franks convert. Oh, happily, this is the nice version. Eventually, it was was really something much more controversial, um, and especially pushed properly by by Clovis himself. That, however, made the best investment of his life, considering that he came from a mixed background. His father was. A, a very fine uh, Frankish chieftain that had served the Romans that knew Gaul very well, uh, what the, what the, 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 the empire was, etc. His mother was a Thuringian pagan that she believed behave, belonged, excuse me, to the essentially to the, the, the stock that would oppose the 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 Romanization and Catholicization. They the Thuringians were part of the Gothic axis, right? Not the the Frankish Roman one, and so. Think about the choice of this man, and what the 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 literally this was one of the single uh, most impacting choices in the history of mankind for Clovis to have decided to to stick from 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 the Roman Catholic side and changing literally the world forever. Um, after his uh, so he. He went on, eventually, as we were saying before, he um, deci decisively defeated the Visigothic kingdom at Toulouse, uh, of Toulouse in the Battle of Vouillet in 507. Then after his death, his kingdom was partitioned among his four sons, as we already said, and this tradition of partition continued over the next century. Right? So even when several Merovingian kings simultaneously ruled their own realms, the kingdom not unlike the late Roman Empire, was conceived of a single entity ruled collectively by several kings, right? Because they were all of the same blood. So in their own realms, though, uh, among whom a turn of events could result in the reunification of the whole kingdom under a single ruler. This is a very convenient thing, because uh, it, it is to be found in other realities. Think about the Kievan rules. I mean, this idea of thinking to descend from a, from a single dynasty, but then still, and therefore legitimizing the elite in the single uh, chunks of this, of this mm, territory, but um, is, is still, uh, you know, in fact, ma minding their own business in the relative same and kind of competing with one another. It's actually a very strong uh, you know, it can't be, as we've seen, civilly uh, disrupted, destructive, but um, at the same, from an ideological point of view, it's still enforced that, you know, it, it still shows, first of all, they had managed to assert that primate over the Frankish people, and that, uh, yes, these rulers could fight against one another, but the primacy of the dynasty and their blood was not contested. And in fact, it was never contested. And this is very interesting as well. And this literally goes for the ruthless and bloody policy of Clovis that, I mean, literally beheaded all the, <laughs> the various Frankish chieftains in, in, a, in an incredibly violent sequence. And all the stories surrounding Clovis, read the one about the vase of Soissons, like this was a person that could split the, 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 the skull of a person, in, you know, cold-blooded, you know, like, you know, just like that, to, to assert in front of everybody that nobody could even dare to think to, to challenge his own uh, authority. And this is how you build a, a real authority, right? And uh, it was earned in blood, in blood, in a lot of blood, especially. And um, upon Clovis' death um, in 511, the Merovingian kingdom included, at that point, all of Gaul except Burgundy, that was kind of bit bitching around between, uh, you know, the, given that it, it was, um, you know, decentralized enough, but also entrenched in the mountains. So they, they also looked at Italy, at Gaul, the, depending on the situation and trying to, to think their own thing. Um, and all of the Germania Magna, except Saxony, that, as you know, was, um, was conquered by Charlemagne for good. Uh, later on, and um, this is important because you know the, the Merovingians 
initially the grip that the Merovingians had on, on these other areas of Germany was looser than the one the Carolingians would have. But it's very important and overlooked how much the Merovingians actually proceeded with the colonization of Germany, how much they, they continued for, fundamentally were the Romans had stopped, you know, to, to expand in the area, to call to, to, to deforest, to found uh, towns, to, to, to connect the, um, the, the, the wall system. At this point, they had to fight against the, the other incursions uh, in Germany. They had to, you know, they, they were invested in the area and they maintained as client kingdoms all these various peoples, including, for example, the Bavarians, that differently from the other Germanic peoples, were not really an ethnic uh, reality, but they were formed as a duchy by the same friends and they um, they remained up to far almost to Austria fundamentally as you understand there with the border with the our Kaganate, the, the Frankish held territory uh, it's in spite of the I mean Frank Frankish controlled uh, entity let's say better in spite of this uh, swings let's say this uh, intermittent Merovingian power that when it would crumble and the split in all these in these four kingdoms would was in effect. In fact, sometimes they sided with the Longbirds, etc., and so on. But by far, still, the broader Frankish system was more powerful as, than any other in the area. Um, to the outside of the kingdom, even when divided under different kings, um, you know, the other peoples, were, as we've seen, however, were still within the the, the Frankish orbit, right? Burgundy was conquered finally in 534. After the fall of the Ostrogoths, the Franks also conquered Provence that Theodoric had invaded and seized. And in fact, the Italian borders here are important as well because when the Ostrogothic power fell, fundamentally, um, the uh, the Franks uh, managed to occupy the uh, the Alpine passes that would remain still today the the border between Italy and France. It's normally, between countries, it's at the watershed, right of the man. It said. You, France always maintained the upper hand as a greater unified power, and the bo the border stands from, let's say, the, the Italian side, rather. So uh, this started ever since back in, in the day when the Longobards had invaded, you know, after the Gothic War, actually, and when the, when the Longobards invaded uh, the, the peninsula, and still, albeit, they, they managed to survive to, to the joint Frankish-Byzantine assaults in the 6th, 7th uh, century. They they always regarded as you know the the alpine watershed you know in favor of the franks uh, traditionally um also the boundary with visigothic septimania remained uh, fairly stable uh, now internally the kingdom as we've seen was divided among clovis sons and l later among his grandsons and frequently saw war between the different kings who could quickly allied among themselves and against each other uh, with the most atrocious uh, dynastic feuds, and uh, the death of, of one king created conflict between the surviving brothers the, and the deceased sons with different outcomes, right? You would go after the children, this was done, right? You would want it to literally cut down uh, their, their, their seed, um, uh, to literally to claim overlordship. And um, later conflicts were also intensified by the personal feud around uh, Brunhild, that was a hell. Here, women, women were queens. Um, the Frankish queens had some beautiful, dramatic stories, by the way, that are all actually interpreted historiographically at the time in kind of a, um, you know, edifying fashion. Because at this point, they just the Christians wrote, but they they were actually sometimes very powerful individuals, and they uh, they were very capable and very concrete. Brunhild especially was uh, a great. Um, ruler and uh, if you know the story she ended uh, quartered by being pulled by 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 horses that's that that um kind of the the frankish uh, style if you wonder what we are concretely talking about um however yearly warfare often did not constitute let's say a massive um, devastation of the infrastructural reality of goal let's say um uh, it was as savage as it could be um, but given that it was directed to dynastic ends, this is to be seen in this uh, character. It's a bit like the Wars of the Roses. They fought over and over again, but they wouldn't destroy much of England because what, what they were after were not loot or something. They were just knocking out that single guy on the field so that for the, dyna the dynastic puzzle could, you know, finally be sorted out. I mean, to, to be completed. And the... Uh, 
the same goes with the Franks in this regard, that well, by having a powerful military that, especially during the 7th century contraction of Europe, demographic, economic uh, resources, etc., surely had slowed down. We see it properly by scale. Clovis could launch offensives, uh, uh, kill, you know, hundreds, several hundreds of kilometers away with ease. At this point, it became almost like wars were becoming hunting parties, right? But there is a kind of... of and, and this is not surprising that it happened in France, this uh, essentially quasi-chivalric um, establishment of rules and norms about properly what war had to be, this uh, ideally noble way of war for which, you know, among aristocrats they would manage, you know, things, even in spite of this, uh, as we've seen, um, radical violence, but still, you know, minding that it was not about destroying each other's kingdom, because technically it was... Everybody wanted to have it in, in, integrally, so, um, and um, this is a consideration to make because chivalry was not invented, you know, in a day. It was something that dates back to the Proto-Indo-European, you know, equestrian culture and so on, and 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 was revived under these quasi-feudal realities, as we can understand. Um, eventually, Clotaire II, in 613, reunited the entire Frankish realm under one uh, rule. Uh, later divisions produced the stable units of Austrasia, Neustria, Burgundy, and Aquitania for good, meaning that even these territorial repartitions, aside from the general, you know, ethnic, geographical, pol say, um, uh, unity that they, they already had uh, on their own. They, they somewhat were, however, redrawn a little bit. There were some boundaries were adjusted, and however, they emerged as the as um, important areas on their own. So some would fundamentally disappear in a, in a, in a way. At least Austrasia would, would not survive as such, unless we consider it as a sort of broader Lotharingia or something like that in later centuries, but it's not, there is nothing teleological about it. Now, the frequent wars had weakened royal power, of course, and this is the reason why the aristocracy had made great gains and procured enormous concessions from the kings in return from their support. Essentially, these were the great uh, Gallo-Roman Frankish lords, who uh, had always ruled, uh, also ecclesiastical ones, as lords of their own cities, of their own, um, of their own territory, and that uh, were seeing their own control of the area increasingly as a in, uh, hereditary prerogative, right? And uh, among the wars between the Merovingians, all these, in the lack of a statal reality, as we will see now, um, the the way was essentially favoring. Them, like granting them some further, you know, rights on their of rule on on their territory, always on behalf of the king, because technically this was believed to be, as we've seen, a dynastic, a private possession. Always, there is nothing more effective than the word "private" to define the Merovingian rule and its own its own uh, public aspect. This is not a public reality for as such. It's named Frankish Kingdom. It has this broader ideal, you know, uh, popular concept, but it's factually, it is only and exclusively a private possession. Everything is thought, there is not an idea, I have to obey a greater authority, because the, the authority, or a greater good, the, the, the good or authority is the king himself and his blood. Right, so it's, it's, it, it's theirs. It's a private thing. Um, and this is how they see, by right of conquest, the wall thing. Um, this happened also elsewhere, but let's say that in this country where the monarchy was eventually not, never to be contested anymore, um, there is no other ideology that develops in parallel to it to counter it in any other way. Um, these concessions saw the very considerable power of the king parceled out and retained by the leading comites, uh, and duchess, so counts and dukes that were essentially the, the comites, especially the, the main, um, uh, uh, say, the, w there had been a partially public, let's say, when the, the Merovingians had invaded Gaul, they naturally began to rule on the Roman administrative base, right, and they had sent their own counts to, you know, men of trust, their own military clientels, etc., to rule these various areas, right, and uh, calling them 
uh, comitas, right, and uh, essentially occupying largely what had been the, the previous Roman destructuation of the dio provincial diocese and so on. And however, marrying to the local aristocracies and therefore becoming essentially lords on their own. Right, and very little is known about the course of the seventh um, century um, due to scarcity of sources. But we understand that, uh, in spite of the uh, aggrandizement uh, and the entrenchment um, and of the increasing power of, of these lords in the room, in the essentially in the periphery of, of the kingdom, the Mer and even in its own heart, the Merovingians remained powerful. Um, until the eighth century, right? But they were recognized as a, you know, as a functional dynasty, up to the, the rise of the Carolingians, right? And and the uh, say uh, th there is the, the myth, in fact, of of this incapacity of the Merovingian rulers, and that is very unfair and generous if you realize what seventh century Europe, especially north of the Alps, concretely could be in terms of, of resource centralization and whatever. They achieved through that something that was unthinkable before, we, we, as we have seen from an, from an ideological standpoint and its legacy and its factual capacity to, to revive the same power on, on, the same, on the same pattern later on by the Carolingians. Clotaire's son Dagobert died in 639, who sent troops in Spain and pagan Slavic territories in the east, is commonly seen as the last powerful Merovingian king. While the later ones are known as Roi Fénéant, uh, so the literally do nothing kings, despite the fact that only the last two ones f were literal papas who d wouldn't achieve anything. And the kings, even strong-willed men like Dagobert II and Kilperic II, were uh, not the main agents of political conflicts. Um, leaving uh, this role to their mayors of, of the palace, who increasingly substituted their own interest for, for their kings. Uh, this was though a, a a, a gradual process, um, and it was not dictated by, uh, let's say, uh, a nature of this dynasty or, you know, a sort of, you know, lack of interest that these guys would say, okay, well, you know, we just hand down power to these major domes because what, what may ever happen, right? I will st simply spend my life retired in this country mansion uh, and you know while these other guys kill each other out there in, in, in my name no many many kings came to the throne at a young age and died in the prime of life also probably because they were assassinated so uh, the all the infights and all the clashes all the intrigues d deteriorated royal power further right and when you don't have a, a safe stable um, a public asset where you can fall back on to counter these um, uh, these pushes. You're fundamentally uh, just uh, one of the many in this lordly game, and and this is and it's already remarkable. In fact, as we were saying before, how much the system could could leave on in, in legacy to be recollected by the Carolingians and revived and further, you know, re-expanded and reconsolidated. Uh, to, to create something like a universal Roman Empire once again in, in West. So that that also in perspective is, is very powerful. Um, and the conflict between mayors was ended when the Austrasians under um, Pepin the Middle triumphed in 687 in the Battle of Tertri. Uh, that is regarded a bit as the rise of the Carolingians. But um, the um, th this is not say, at the definitive rise of the Carolingians. Actually, it took a lot of time before Carolingians would secure power. Um, or, in fact, they, they could even, you know, hope to become the, were the ones that managed eventually to be. But after this event, Pepin, but not a king, was the political ruler of the Frankish kingdom, in a sense, and left this position as a heritage to his sons, predispositionally. So, it was now the sons of the mayor that divided the realm among each other under the rule of a single king. This passed, however, through a very gradual, mm, you know, uh, uh, ousting of the, of the various mayors of palace, right? So, uh, Tertri is not really the, uh, the 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 real turning point. It was just you know an important point of emergence, and 
pretty much it. After Pepin's long rule, his son Charles Martel assumed power, fighting, in fact, again against nobles and his own stepmother, by the way. And his reputation for ruthlessness further undermined the king's position. And under Charles Martel's leadership, the Franks famously defeated the Moors at the Battle of Tours in 732, after the victory of 718 of the Bulgarian Khan Tervel and the Emperor Byzantine Leo III, the Isaurian over the Arabs at Akroinos, led by Maslam Ibn uh, Abd al-Malik, prevented the attempts of Islam to expand uh, into is Eastern Europe, the victory of Charles Martel uh, limited its expansion to the west uh, of the European continent. Right, And uh, during the last years of his life, uh, he even ruled without a king. Uh, though he did not assume ro royal dignity, he was they, they wouldn't dare do it. His sons Carloman and Pepin again appointed a Merovingian figurehead, the Skelderic III, to stem rebellion on the kingdom's periphery. However, in 751, Pepin finally displaced the last Merovingian and with the support of the nobility and the blessing of Pope Zachary, uh, that was the only intermediary that could make this this switch, became one of the Frankish kings. Uh, Kilperic III was fundamentally um, an obscure figure that had been temporarily put on the throne to, um, to in fact, to act as a Merovingian, so to confer power to the same mayor of palace that was acting on his own behalf, right? And the papal connection with the Franks here was just revived, right? The Pope Zachary, by uh, anointing the uh, the 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 Frankish um, king was uh, Pepin wasn't um, wasn't really doing something so revolutionary like you know the, the, there had always a, been a very strong contact between Rome and and Francia and uh, properly a, a a broader Catholic alliance that had uh, helped. Uh, the Merovingian monarchy also to consolidate its own power, to shape it in a, an orderly way, also in terms of ecclesiastical administration, dignity, and so on. So at this point, the Franks use this connection to put an end to the institutional fiction of the Merovingian dynasty that effectively has no no concrete power anymore in their figures, and to, to essentially... Uh, formalize their own rise that had already happened at this point they would control most of the air but even with the Carolingians the problem the same problems that had afflicted the Merovingian dynasty would represent right and uh, the, the the same Carolingian empire is is an accident because if it hadn't been for um, first of all, these you know very strong figures like Pepin the, the middle then Charles Martel Pepin the short etc and but uh, there would have not been, first of all been a Carolingian uh, monarchy in power but also if um, Charlemagne and Louis de Pius had not been essentially their their the the, the survivor the only surviving brothers of their own respective um, in fact siblings they uh, the, the the same Carolingian empire in its unity would have not existed like Charlemagne was lucky his brother Carloman against whom he fought all the time died but you know that unity was uh, just an accident of uh, you know of biology right of these people to leave on like in others to die but um, the uh, the same thing that would that had brought the Merovingians down is the same one that would bring the, the Carolingians down in, in perspective. It wasn't just a, a dynastic problem, but surely if at every generation you split the country and you start fighting against one another, well, you can't complain <laughs> if things go downhill, right? So um, we, when we look at this history, we have to, to be very uh, concrete and objective about the fact that um, the Merovingians were not, let's say, something inherently different from a political institutional point of view from what the Carolingians became aside from the broader international dignity the uh, renewal of the Roman Empire all the the ideology the the further expansion etc um, uh, the the opportunities that arose internationally speaking that were all very contingental and really um, were not meant to happen for some greater 
uh, reason of, of, of necessity of history, right? They happened because they managed to do it, but also got an incredible amount of luck together with also naturally an enormous amount of, of scale of leadership, of cost, of, of wars, and so on. Um, so speaking of uh, Merovingian government, well, the monarch would essentially uh, re redistribute conquer we uh, conquered wealth among his followers. Again, this is exactly what the Carolingians built their empire like. The Merovingians had done the same. Uh, we're talking both of um, material wealth and the land, including its uh, indentured peasantry. That was, in fact, the, the, the most important asset there. Um, Remember this, the Gallo-Roman Latifundium was intact, so uh, these uh, Frankish nobility married into the the, 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 the Gallo-Roman one, uh, the bishops were extremely powerful at this time, they married uh, and behaved, lived like secular lords, including military life on a regular basis, there was no difference, it was allowed, they, nobody would see anything strange about that, so they simply... Uh, this this uh, dynastic ties would also develop at a lesser level, in order to to create this greater landed seigneuries, exploiting you know the low the local labor to 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 reinforce their own their own control to 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 build develop further. I mean, goal was at this point essentially the richest uh, country in Europe in absolute terms, right? In at least in Latin Germanic Europe, um, in terms properly of amount of wealth, that means you know amount of people and and you know agricultural production, right? In quantitatively speak, and the um, um, these powers were not absolute as we've seen in general. It was, they were also floating. There was a very Machiavellian political you know attention to everything that could. Um, provide uh, advantage to disadvantage um, and uh, always remember that as the Merovingians split their their patrimony at, among the, the male heirs at every uh, generation so the, the other noblemen did because that was their tradition their custom and so the same problems the Merovingians faced were faced also by this lesser nobility um, as we are saying before some scholars have attributed um, to the Merovingians, a uh, lack of uh, sense of um, res publica, right, of statal, of public culture. Other historians have criticized this view as an oversimplification, but factually, um, uh, albeit indeed, the uh, as we've seen, the, there was a sense of 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 um, of unity, let's say, represented by the monarchy in itself and by the the establishment that had managed to. To consolidate um, the the private nature of Carolingian of, of Frankish public culture, we made a video about that. Speaking of the Carolingians, but this fits completely well to Merovingians. is is quite realistic. Like in Fran in, in Gaul, you don't find any other um, let's say concrete um, public institution and say, well, this is factually just the, the survival of an idea of state. Right when the kings appointed magnates uh, to be comites, uh, charging them with defense, administration, and judgment of disputes, you see that th this was done in ways that were, you know, were not fundamentally codified. It was just about the the local customs and traditions, and things went on more or less on their own. Where is the the ghost, let's say, of a state of a, of a sense of a republic that survives in this? It was all private, as we've seen. It was exclusively private. So. It's actually very accurate, in my opinion, to stress how this was true, and this would remain in those countries for for so many time. I mean, look at the French nobility uh, uh, and monarchy. I mean, that that it was a deeply ingrained, um, um, macroscopic, by the way, cultural feature of 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 uh, of of the of the Frankish oligarchy that w wouldn't wouldn't contemplate anything else, right? The, the Roman state had evaporated, the Germans fundamentally were, you know, warlike, ruthless people who truly believed in the, um, in the right of the stronger to rule, and everybody who was conquered fundamentally was worth zero, right? These people, as we've seen, were, had, had been also loosely Romanized, as we will see now, especially in the north of Gaul, when the, most of the Franks settled, you know, that Roman civic ideals had fundamentally 
you know, had already declined in the late empire in general, and, and the same Gallo-Romans were quite private in nature. What, what do you think that would push these people to have a public a, ideal of, of state? There wasn't. We're talking about the early Middle Ages, and we're talking about, you know, c civilization having existed in these regions from not even a millennium. So, uh, what before literally nothing else had ever happened, of course, was prehistory. What, what do you think th there could be? You know, wh why would there be, wouldn't be there? Of course, the Merovingians themselves, as elite, who played big, let's say, and, and realized what more concretely than any other, the pressure and the they worked in order to create something more centralized, but their means, factually, were not um, statal in nature. They were something still founded on a private on private clientels, and what was more logical to do, trying to to centralize those prerogatives, as you see, the cooling factors of cooptation, for example, of, for example, also compacting further some uh, nobiliar a possession so that you could control through those key figures greater areas of of um of, of the kingdom etc um it, it's that simple we don't have to search for a modern determinism to stress that you know um there must have been some kind of um, public ideal behind all this because otherwise you you can't explain well of course if you we speak by absolutes for sure that like this one's not zero percent but at the same time let's be honest about what nature of frankish power essentially was, it was only private uh, the rest is virtually insignificant and consider that as we were saying before the, the roman sy systems of taxation proxy had fundamentally collapsed also from a monetary point of view right it was uh, this was a long process the, the think about the unknown and how the same Romans had settled federati in Gaul to essentially leave off the, some parts of the, the properties of the land that were already, uh, you know, settled by by previous agents of the state as lords fundamentally. And, you know, the Franks uh, had taken over such administration and they, they also they gradually penetrated into the thoroughly Romanized west and south of Gaul that truly were more civilly advanced right um as the the legal history of these countries fundamentally is like the visigothic law the burgundian law were were roman law the the, the franks didn't have that they had a customary law as we will see in a while um the administration works so with counts having to provide armies enlisting their milites and endowing them with land in return so doing the same thing as vassals fundamentally and these armies were subject to the king's call for military support in theory, and annual national assemblies of the nobles and their armed retainers decided major policies of war making because at the end of the day the, the Carolingians didn't invent the fact of going at war every single damn year so much that uh, you know the only important news in, in Frankish chronicles regarding to, uh, to, to military expeditions is the years in which this didn't happen because it would have been something exceptional. Uh, the Merovingians were the same why did these people came with the retinues? Because they had to codify, you know, a low, orderly, civilly. No, because they had to. That was they had to to gather the army to, to launch the, the next offensive that same season, and and uh, and going on. It was a an important process also of of monarchy making, meaning that through these assemblies it was possible to 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 strengthen further clientelly ties to um to um, properly address you know to channel some certain resources towards you know your political goals etc the army also claimed new kings by raising them on it, on its shields continuing an ancient practice that made the king leader of the warrior band uh as we've seen this was present actually among all the indo-european peoples it was uh, a Ger german tradition as much as roman we were talking about properly archaic Rome. It was the same thing, like uh, among the the Germans, among the Celts, etc. And the the important though is that now the Merovingians were yes, there was this institutional formality of the election of the king um, with arms, etc. But uh, as we have seen, uh, it was first and foremost about his blood. Furthermore. 
the king was expected to support himself with the products of his private domain, the royal domain, which was called still the fisc, uh, uh, according to the Roman tradition. And this was important because naturally in such a thoroughly Romanized area like Gaul, more or less, depending on the region, of course, but, you know, a masterpiece of Romanization. Um, the idea of fisc, so here you see there is a trace of public ideal, but, you know, one thing is calling your royal domain a fisc to stress that it's public, to stress that nobody can touch it, etc., because there is a tradition before that also legally stressed it. Another thing is concretely realizing that this royal domain went parceled out among private connections of clientelly nature for just staying alive um, as a monarch, and uh, so this system developed in time into feudalism, right? Expectations of royal self-sufficiency surely lasted on, right? But they're not a much of a civic principle themselves, meaning that uh, that is true when the, the royal fisc is, is great, right? When it is not, it's just a sort of anarchy where every clan every yeah every count every lord is it's just essentially um, a mafia boss in his own territory and decides whether the king can't do or can't do certain things because he wants essentially to do his own business so this idea has remained until the hundred years war and properly uh, you know eventually what was french st state policy making that was also quite successful um but let's say this goes in part, you see, this contraction, this collapse of, of a state, if you want, of what was left of it, would essentially happened because of the broader uh, decline of, econo of economy, of the demographics, etc., by the, sixth, the seven, second half of the 6th century. This can be easily measured if you study, for example, the Merovingian military campaigns. You realize, as, you, as we were saying before, how, um, uh, you know, you know how small armies I don't know from the early 7th century were compared to the ones of uh, the one of Clovis because properly you understand that they there were no resources they also exhausted a lot of them by continuous war right and uh, trade declined uh, agricultural estates were mostly self-sufficient right so also that process of encastellation gradually began right not castles as we imagined them from the ones from in stone from the the low middle ages but in, meaning castellation as a sort of development of a territorial signory with a fortifications with 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 a sound territorial control right there was some broader international scale trade though as always this was dominated by middle eastern merchants often the jewish radanites that before the rise of the Italian maritime republics were effectively the most active of uh, European um, uh, merchants, and that you see in Gaul, especially in central and southern Gaul, uh, you know, in late Roman times, there were lots of um, also of Syrian communities of Middle Eastern communities that, especially, in, were involved in trade, money lending, things like that. So that there was also survival in um, in, in such city, in important cities, right? Gaul, as we've seen, was being deeply romanized means being deeply urbanized so um cities had surely declined it's and so their their internal administration organization but they were still very important in the uh, for the factual um, territorial control power uh, of the of the Merovingians in this case, and also the, all these other bishops were extremely powerful within their own cities. As you know, there were some of the major, as we've seen, military men of the of the period. Now, Merovingian law was not universal uh, and uh, applicable to all. Right, it was applied to each man according to his origin. The Ripuarian Franks were subject to their own Lex Ripuaria, codified at a late date, while the so-called Lex Salica the Salic law of the Salian clans, first uh, tentatively codified in 511, was invoked under medieval exigencies as late as the Valois era, because mostly of the issue of um, female inheritance. And in this, the Franks lagged behind the Burgundians and the Visigoths, as we were saying before, that they had no uh, universal-based uh, law. In fact, in Merovingian times, a law remained in the um, rote memorization of the uh, Rakimburgs, the Rakimburgi, who essentially were, you know, men of 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 um, of essentially they had this oral tradition that they memorized and they would 
become a legal experts for right and which essentially was based on precedence it was on, on the customs of the land right and Merovingian law did not admit the concept of creating new law right but only of maintaining tradition as such um, and nor did its Germanic traditions offer any code of civil law right uh, this required essentially a, a more advanced administrative society um, and um, like you could find at this point with the Byzantine Empire with Justinian the first etc instead in the West in Latin Germanic Europe more or less this thing has fallen concretely even in the most Romanized areas uh, in the practice right it's just that some regions such as in the north of Europe in this case uh, were uh, completely like alien to, to such practice and they it was enough just to rule things like this because also let's be honest if if uh, you know, voice right and voice wrong is to be decided with swords, right? Yeah, you know, you don't even need that. So that's essentially Germanic law in a nutshell. And the few surviving Merovingian edicts are almost entirely concerned with settling divisions among uh, of estates among their heirs, right? And that's what would factually settle uh, the matter, right? How much land uh, the, the various uh, princes would have to 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 own so that this could um, in hopefully avoid and mostly you know um, failingly so um, avoid further clash but it was it was I mean how much land you know you owned was the measure of your political power because it meant labor force and military retinues thus um, the Byzantine coinage was uh, in use in Francia before Theodobert I began minting his own money at the start of his reign. Uh, he was the first to issue distinctly Merovingian coinage. Uh, on gold coins struck in his royal workshop, Theodobert is shown in the pearl studded regalia of the Byzantine emperor. Right, and this tells you how much these peoples, at the end of the day, all still believed to be in the Roman Empire. And for a very pragmatic necessity, that was to say to receive delegation from the same emperor to rule, to, to legitimize their own territorial rule. The same Clovis had uh, re received a pallium uh, that did the vicary of, 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 of the Gauls, right, from from the Eastern Roman Emperor, um, there was, as we've seen, this uh, anxiety from the Merovingian side to cumulate as many ideological prerogatives as possible to reinforce their own uh, individual control. Uh, in this coins, Kildebert, uh, the first is shown in profile in the ancient style, wearing a toga and a diadem. The Solidus and uh, Trians were minted in Francia between 534 and 679. Uh, it was mostly, as you understand, a kind of aristocratic dominated uh, economy market. The denarius, in fact, uh, or uh, denier, uh, uh, appeared later in the name of Kilderic II and various non royals around 673 675. A Carolingian denarius replaced the Merovingian one, and the Frisian pending. Uh, in uh, in in gold from 755 to the essentially to the 11th century, um, and uh, there are collections um, Merovingian coins at the Monet de Paris in Paris, um, and uh, also Merovingian gold coins at the uh, Bibliothèque Na Nationale, uh, Cabinet de Médailles. Now speaking of religion, as we were saying before. Christianity was introduced to the Franks by their contact with Gallo-Roman culture and uh, further spread by monks over time. Uh, but it was very superficial. The most famous, of, consider North of the Alps people concretely, he, here also they were largely literate, right? Properly the elite and the same, we're speaking of the bishops, etc. But the Gaul had, telling the truth, a bit more of a classical legacy, especially Southern Gaul had some of the greatest cultural centers in the in the west, the, the Lorraine Islands especially, but these were all a relic of late antique culture and, you know, as it was normal in this broadly Frankish dominated culture, people couldn't read, wouldn't read, but it was useless, like there, there was not much that would come to practical use, in fact, to, to knowing how to read and write. As a consequence, however, uh, Christian understanding was appallingly low. These were f f namely Christian, they would 
you know, they had churches, they practiced, etc., but they couldn't basically even read Latin, right? Before the Carolingian ecclesiastical reforms, like, I don't know, it was said in Bavaria that they read, they couldn't even read the Latin and, and, and they, they would completely change the words from the Bible. I mean, it was a mess, right? You know, um, the most famous of these missionaries is St. Columbanus um, that uh, practiced, you know, that spread for an Irish monk that died in 615 that, as you know, spread its own, um, uh, you know, teaching um, all over Gaul, um, Italy, etc. And Merovingian kings and queens used the newly forming ecclesiastical power structure to their advantage. As we have seen countless times in the Carolingian uh, clergy videos, monasteries and episcopal seats were shrewdly awarded to elites who supported the dynasty. And extensive parcels of land were donated to monasteries to exempt those lands from royal taxation and to preserve them within the, f the family. Um, so that this was done both by the 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 kings and the their their lords because it was a way essentially to um, provide ideally uh, such um, you know certain family members with um, uh, that would be loyal to to the to to the family of origin some. Uh, assets that in theory were not to be inherited by the individual abbot or you know bishop etc but that factually was so right especially in these realities in early medieval times um, and that however still retained some kind of you know let's say greater chance of continuity over time compared to secular assets right between partitions and other problems so this was a way an attempt to centralize through private means, but still, you know, exploiting the church immunities and prerogatives to, um, um, to, to, to benefit of families that maintain, for example, dominance over the monastery by appointing family members as abbots when they died, that, that was not uh, transmissible just in, in sons, we say. Uh, extra sons and daughters of who could not be married off were sent to monasteries so they could they they would not threaten the inheritance of older Merovingian children it was another practice the pragmatic use of monasteries ensured also close ties between the elites and monastic properties that would last um, um, for for centuries right and beyond um, numerous Merovingians who served as bishops and abbots or who generously funded abbeys and monasteries were rewarded with sainthood as well so Sacralization was actually present in Christian function, and uh, having uh, a saint within the, the the dynasty was a was a great prestige. That also in later times in medieval, you know, in later medieval and and modern Europe would remain an important international prerogative. And at the time, they they truly believed there was some magic properly connected with the blood, in fact, and so this very physical connection and emanation of power of, of magic of, of uh, um, in that, that that was just also beyond the salvation and also useful materially like in in, uh, in uh, earthly life in a typically pagan contractual uh, me mentality um, and um, uh, the, the outstanding handful of Frankish saints who were not of the Merovingian kingship nor the f family alliances that provided Merovingian counts and dukes deserve also closer inspection for, if anything, for one thing. Because like Gregory of Tours, they were almost without exception from the Gallo-Roman aristocracy in regions south and west of Merovingian control. Right. Um, there is a deep divide, as we will see, ethnically between the north and the south of France, and properly in the nature of power itself, right? Um, and consider that at the evaporation of Roman state, effectively Gaul was ruled by bishops, so the, um, the sacrality acquired by properly the, the lords, um, the ecclesiastical lords in the areas that were under, you know, less... Um, uh, tighter, uh, less tight um, royal control was kind of unitly connected to these uh, sanctifications of these uh, geographical literature, you know, that is also quite prolific, in fact, in southern France, etc. 
Um, Merovingian hagiography did not set out to reconstruct a biography in the Roman or the modern sense, but, let's say, to attract and hold popular devotion by the formulas of elaborate literary exercise, which the Frankish church channeled popular piety within orthodox channels, um, so um, spreading, you know, the, an ideology of obedience towards authorities and toward, you know, it would give... Um, provide with trust and security for also for, from the, also these upheavals, this instability. Defined also the nature of sant sanctity, uh, retain some control over the posthumous cults that develop spontaneously at the burial sites, for example, where the life force of the saint lingered to, good, to do good for, for the votary. Uh, consider that the countrysides here were, uh, were fundamentally pagan, still and that the broader process of pacification and territorial control passed through the uh the the substitution of this culture also that were often led through i don't know brigands i mean uh, w what are all these um you know wolves and snakes and monsters that uh, hide in the forest etc that are evidently also properly people that that were Believing maybe the older life still pagan kind of chieftain like um, religiously imbued uh, say like warrior beasts things like that that were eradicated eventually by the uh, bishop authority in a broader you know civilizational sense because at the end of the day these were greater you know community structures and they they were effectively organizing communities in a more rational and orderly way. Um, the vite et uh, miracula for impressive miracles were an essential element of Merovingian hagiography, were read aloud on saints' feast days, so the, the illiterate could listen to them, being fascinated by the marble of it, and many Merovingian saints and the majority of female saints were local ones. Right, Gaul had a rich um, pre-Christian religious background, right, and it um, also because of the size of the country, its diversification, but properly because of the you know the local wealth of the differentiation, etc. So these figures were gradually transformed. They were venerated um, in uh, especially in strict circumscribed regions that had properly an identity on their own. Their cults were revived also in the Middle Ages further when the population of women in religious orders increased enormously and they found this connection in the previous tradition. And um, uh, there are very striking um, trans-secular connections. We're talking about um, some lists of the saints that were uh, were r written down in, in, in the 13th century, so that we're talking about literally, um, yeah, 700 years of distance, but a bit, bit less, 600, uh, something like that. But I mean, it's impressive. And ethnically speaking, and mostly in terms of language, because also you know genetics, uh, you know, they can't quite satisfactorily be measured from relics of of, of the time, etc. But we get a better picture still with you know other 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 means like we we understand that of course the gallo-roman population was far greater than the frankish population in merovingian gaul right uh, this is true especially of the regions south of the seine right the franks were not many also their their settlement was very gradual and as we've seen, the Germanic element had concentrated mostly towards uh, Austrasia, so it remained close to the Rhine, that also had, you know, some some activity, etc. But um, the the especially the dynastic character of the Merovingian monarchy um, had naturally facilitated the integration of uh, of this family within a pre-existing uh, hierarchy that, as we've seen, was local essentially. Uh, Clovis would have, could have never managed to to, to seize uh, so successfully the control of the wall goal if he had not converse, converted to Catholicism, right? It would have been always a mess, like in, in, in Spain, like in any country where, you know, there was a Catholic majority and, let's say, an Aryan uh, minority trying to leave, and that would have created m more divisions. And so that's why the greatness also of Clovis, because he did something that is easily as you know important fundamentally as Constantine the first in 
the inside. Um, and um, most of the Frankish settlement was located properly between the lower and the middle Rhine. It would remain there, right? In in Neustria, um, uh, north of the Loire, let's say, there was also a significant Frankish presence that would evidently, uh, you know, influence the language. Uh, and uh, but they were still the minority of the population. In general, the further south in Gaul one travels, the weaker the Frankish influence becomes. Like, um, uh, there are some, you know, th there is hardly any, you know, trace of settlement of the Franks south of the Loire properly. These were different lands. It's important to stress because historically they had been the, the, the Aquitania and the Gallia Lugdunensis, that eventually was Burgundy in a sense were, as we've seen, different lands, historically, also up to very late in time, like before the 13th century, when you speak of France, you refer to north of the Loire, to the Languedoc region. And in south, uh, Aquitaine, was, was a, it's a place where if you, there are mu beautiful areas there, and so if you love the Middle Ages, think about Carcassonne, uh, Toulouse, um, Narbonne, etc. All many beautiful, uh, that we think it's France. But if you go there, you breathe the air, uh, it's their oxygen in the sense, but you feel the the breath of Spain in a sense, and uh, you understand it's a different cow. So, so Provence is, so a little bit properly Burgundy is. They are they're different countries. They, there were properly cultural, literary, linguistic traditions that were also frankly more advanced than the ones of the north because there is all. Um, I mean. I think about the great composition, the great, uh, the, the troubadour, all, all the, the great um, high medieval literature that developed in those areas, but properly the influence of of the Roman uh, world and eventually of the Arab world that poured all those, you know, Roman and Greek translations back um, into, into the, the country. Some of the greatest figures of, of uh, high medieval culture, think about... Um, um uh, de Vaurillac and all the universalistic kind of also scientifically or encyclopedically oriented culture of, of of the time that would refuel and rethink even unitarily the the papacy it said where they came from areas like uh Auvergne, like uh, that were deeply connected to for example their Visigothic past in a sense so uh, it was very ethnically composed as we've seen and it was mostly a matter of say elites having more the international connection with it, also within the, within Gaul, but the, the populations often retaining properly different different um, ethnic traits, uh, customs, uh, and so on, right? And in Neustria, Burgundy and Aquitaine, let's say that Latin remained the spoken language in Gaul. Right and throughout the Merovingian period, and so well even into the Carolingian one. And uh, the, with all these modifications, of course, and um, the Ger Germanic language was spoken, however, as a second tongue by public officials in Western Austrasia, and now as late as, as the 50s of the 9th century, after which, um, in Gaul properly, um, German was not spoken anymore since since the the 10th century, for a Germanic language was not spoken anymore. Um, and um, yeah, and uh, what are the sources also of Merovingian history? If you are interested, well, of course, um, the most important one is uh, the histories of uh, the canonized bishop of Tours, Gregory, uh, that uh, traces, um, you know, is a primary source for the reigns of the sons of Clotaire II and, and their descendants until Gregory's own death. In 594, he's the one that tells fundamentally Clovis' history, uh, um, essentially presenting him as the champion of of Christianity, etc. And instead, uh, you know, pointing out how his successors was just you know killing each other because they were you know, sinners and so on. So it, it has definitely a pro-church point of view, but it's fascinating because um, it shows how. Um, how deep still this military ethos of the Var of the Carolingian, uh, excuse me, of the Merovingian, uh, of the Frankish counts in general, uh, were uh, properly was. I mean, this difficulty 
that is a very serious problem from a political and strategical point of view to properly teach what authority is that that is what what is order what is goodness what is you know try to, to make a sensible rational choice and naturally when you read it you understand that these people behave like children almost there are atrocious stories of extreme violence by the way that that are probably accurate they're probably realistic given the times and places surely there is also a more secular logic applied to what the nature properly of of uh, of Merovingian political practice was for which this counts as you know individualistic and charismatic and still kind of warrior minded as you know undisciplined um, thugs but fundamentally you know and, and, and bosses would, would would behave like that that still fit you know uh, the logic of that system that the system was made like that and, sure, and naturally Gregory stresses the difference from the past but actually things have been that rough in many ways um, for a long time right but surely there is however a positive um, understanding of course of what happened to gold to its stabilization after uh, the I mean the, the properly the the, the securitized the, the stabilization of the of, of Merovingian goal right it was seen in a providential term for that and it was yes a work of civilization uh, after all and a great one in insight then the next ma uh, major source is um, the far less organized than Gregory's work that is still part let's say of a late antique uh, tradition the Chronicle of Fredegar. And it was begun by Fredegar, but continued by unknown authors, as is kind of normal in many uh, medieval sources. It, it covers the period from 584 to 641, and um, albeit its continuators under Carolingian patronage extended it to 768, right? So after the close of the Merovingian era, and it is the only primary narrative source for much of its period, which also tells how. Um, you know, in a sense, uh, primitive this world was in terms of properly also literary production. Still, there is probably a contraction of uh, of the late antique intellectual background that transforms into this other, essentially military, private uh, reality. And the um, the al the only uh, other major contemporary source is the Liber Historia Francorum. Uh, an anonymous adaptation of Gregory's work, uh, the, uh, apparently ignorant of Fredegar's chronicle, which is interesting, and its author or multiple authors, and uh, with a reference to Theodoric's the fourth uh, sixth year, which would be 727, and we know it was widely read. Um, and though it was undoubtedly a piece of Arnold thing work, so essentially being essentially from the Carolingian side of the story. It's um, and it's by uh, you know biases caused it to be to to, mean, to to mislead. Let's say, for example, in the two decades between the controversies surrounding Mayor's Grimald the Elder and in Bron, six hundred fifty-two, six hundred seventy-three, it's still you know, an important source that deserves a read. Um, it's kind of insightful. So, um, and the, the um, there are other chronicles of course but um, you know also there are letters not so many actually especially from men of uh, letters as been from the early times capitularies as well uh, and it grants judicial decisions survive as well as the famous Lex Salica we we're mentioning before and from the reign of Clotaire the second and Dagobert the first survive many examples of the royal position as the supreme justice and final arbiter, right? And consider also this: all this ideological development was important, uh, not just because the Merovingians were quite powerful. Probably the beginning, they uh, they they immediately actually started acting like that. But also later on, it was important in the lack of effective power at some point to stress further um, and the the prerogatives of the sovereign in a almost you know a real sense in terms of you know real connection with reality prop there are also as we we're seeing before by lots of uh, geographies uh, life of saints such as, as the ones of saint Eligius and leodegar that were written soon after their um, subjects uh, that's um, and archaeology is important especially about frankish lifestyle 
right? And uh, however, the most important uh, find historically was still connected with the Merovingian dynasty. Uh, it was at the time of the Sand King, the uncovering of Kilderic the First tomb in the Church of Saint um, Brice in, in Tournai. And uh, it, it was impressive because the grave included a golden bull's head and the famous golden insects, right? So the, the bull, think about Merovic and so on. Uh, then the, the these insects are like bees, right? And they're also, in fact, a symbol of the French, like like um, cicadas, halfies, or flies. We don't understand. Napoleon modeled his coronation cloak on the base of these animals. And um, in 19... Uh, 57, the sepulchre of a Merovingian woman at the time believed to be Clotaire's second wife Argon was discovered in the um, uh, Basilica of Saint Denis in, in Paris and her clothes and jewelry are reasonably well preserved um, and giving us you know, a good idea of the costume of, of the time and uh, more in general, um, the Merovingian period is associated with the archaeological uh, High and Kaiba culture that is a bit, you know, what the standard, the Frankish one, also emanating around that some uh, coming from, also stretching other peoples, etc. Areas that is basically these files of, of graves all oriented towards uh, same direction. And, um, and there are lots of military stuff as well. If you travel across France and you you know you go to museums of that makes a bit you know the place now you there is always beautiful car Frankish spatas from sometimes even Merovingian times it's fascinating um, I would conclude on a note that I care about because I addressed the topic uh, in other videos and also was hinting at it at the beginning that is you know the broader significance of the Merovingian dynasty that surely we will keep discussing in depth at some point um, relatively to to our, to our own times right it's obvious that the Merovingians played a prominent role in French historiography and national identity too uh, this is understandable right because the the third republic the born after 1870 and therefore distrustful of the monarchy as a model of government um, uh, brought the, the goals, in fact, on the four in a more popular sense, right? And therefore, you know, stressing the... We're in time which these things are very political in name. There's not a dramatic his, his historical sophistication behind them. It was less, you know, in France, historically, um, the French, uh, with, with all these republics, by the way, show how quickly, also you see with polit modern, you know, political parties, how much, uh, how quickly masses change um, let's say uh, political you know th th they don't entrench traditionally just on the same party they, they, they are fluid they have a you know there is a sense of subtle public democratic participation in France that stems from the revolution from this big problem that historically uh, existed in France that was uh, basically the, the most important country in Europe uh, and um, in uh, in a in, in a sense also the largest properly for considering the amount of the people manpower um, as Napoleon proved it could overrun the entire continent it, it, there was um, let's say uh, naturally a, a deep connection with all these problems of the masses of democracy the republic so the monarchy also however was was necessary still today the, the French president in relative terms uh, within its own state is, is the strongest um, leader in the world because in, institutionally there is uh, an enormous power conferred properly to the head of state in the wake of the uh, of the statal tradition the civil law tradition uh, emerged from the revolution that is present also in, 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 in other countries in Europe but properly also this past of, of monarchy uh, of empire of course, that naturally requires a, a unity uh, of command that other countries wouldn't have, and um, and that in a sense is connected with um, with the rise of what can be seen, if if you don't want to say French, but at least this, the, the the first monarchy that factually ruled the the territory that would become France, and we can't be 
relativistic here. Fundamentally, Frankish power was such as long as it settled gold, right, and had these enormous resources, and fundamentally the, the heart also of Carolingian power later on, what was that one? Essentially northeastern France. Uh, and um, so um, Charles de Gaulle, naturally in a, in a period in history in which France was going across, you know, severe problems after the war and, you know, the process of decolonization, etc., was stressing a national strong um, statalist and nationalist uh, for force, let's say, he, he quoted, he, he said, quote, for me, the history of France begins with Clovis, elected as king of France by the tribe of the Franks, who gave their name to France. Before Clovis, we have Gallo-Roman and Gaulish prehistory. The decisive element for me is that Clovis was the first king to have been baptized a Christian. My country is a Christian country, and I reckon the history of France beginning with the accession of a Christian king who bore the name of the Franks. Now, this is a hell of a phrase if you if you think about that. And uh, naturally, he insists on the Christianity of the country. That surely is something that, you know, today uh, it is true. Like France is a Christian country, factually at least. You know, now uh, societies change ever more quickly. Ever less people are, you know, religious. So let's say, uh, let's not descend into how this can fit still broader, uh, another, say, ideology that substitutes with it, and the statalist one can be considered a sort of monotheism, depending on what you put at the center of it. So these are all considerations that um, are fascinating, but that interest us uh, a bit more than much. But what is crucial here, rather, and uh, it's meant in a... Uh, the goal was stressing it here in a... Uh, in a kind of a democratic sense. I mean, the idea that, that Clovis would be elected by the Franks uh, as the king of the Franks, right? But telling... So it's as if, you know, a, a French president had been elected by the French people. That, that's what he's saying, right? Now, so obviously it was actually a very different thing, as we were saying before. Uh, the Franks were not happy <laughs> of Clovis, at least, you know, his direct... Uh, clientels and those who benefited from it, but you know uh, the, the the increase in uh, in in Merovingian power brought to the ever greater control of of the masses of the freemen that were becoming from freemen to serfs in a sense and so on. And it's also a bit the history of France, like the great oppression that brought to the revolution is a millinery proof. It's, it's a century-like process. It's the idea that you know it mostly crystallized by the, the with the modern age actually what we think actually the ancien regime factually is but f the, the prerogative of goal and it, this unity of command and this professional military in Europe that dominated historically during the modern age and so on derives from this hierarchization of these um, this great land thoroughly controlled in, in population, in territory, and having enormous resources and being delivered orderly by a monarchy against this or that power to extend its and, and consolidate further, right? So this begins in a monarchic sense, in a, truly, with, with, with Clovis, right? Uh, before that, the Romans, yes, there, were, there was, I don't know, think about Tetricus, the Empire of Gauls, etc., but those were subsections of the Roman Empire, fundamentally. They, they looked at a beyond Gaul, ideally. They, they, they had, surely they were the product of a, of a, of a Romano-Gallic reality at that point. But there, you can't say there is a real monarch of Gaul. Right, and um, Gaul is also composite, as we have seen. The Gauls themselves, they, uh, in, spite, in spite of the mm, nationalistic revivals, I don't know, of Vercingetorix for for the French, the Ambiorix for the Belgians. I mean, those country, those peoples have barely anything to do with uh, any unity of these lands, right? And they. Uh, albeit the the Celtic substratum is what's naturally very important for 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 France in, in Roman times in French times still you know as we've seen also those uh, geographic traditions they they drew heavily from this rich Gallic reality that was objectively you know also very composite because as we've seen Aquitaine was something else the Belgica was a but different country from the center and, and of gold proper. It, it was very, it was never a, a united thing, but still 
Gaul, as such, was enucleated by the Romans in an administrative sense. It, it was kind of put on that track in a, in a broader, also infrastructural sense. It was a, a compact unity. I mean, geographically, you realize it's also rather, you know, aside from the eastern border, like from one side you have, two sides you have the sea, from from an, uh, from another side you have also, or and or mountains. And so... Um, more or less it's it's an area where it's a basin where of major rivers in Europe by the way which is another thing that Europe usually doesn't have Europe doesn't really have like other continents or subcontinents some uh, kind of a major valley even of multiple rivers like just France fundamentally has um with with you know in in a in a wider plain without significant geographical obstacles right so that surely favored also the, the compaction of, of a territory of a, of a power um, so but I think truly that in, in a truly political institutional sense and especially in the mythology of the monarchy indeed the Merovingians started what can be seen in perspective as the development of the French monarchy um, broadly meant Right. This doesn't mean that Merovingians equates Carolingians, as we were saying before, or equates Cap uh, Capetians, uh, etc. And, and all you know, fundamentally, forever, because the Capetians remained the only true. I mean, even the Valois and the Bourbon were were Capetians, as a matter of fact. Um, but um, in other dynasties too, by the way. Um, but let's say that the place is the same. Uh, the in a sense, the language is the same. It was becoming the same. The, uh, the 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 political reality that stems from there is the same, right? As I often this, so you see, I'm not teleological about it because um, France is perhaps one of those countries that we have to be the least for granted as a political unity from an historical point of view. I mean, France factually risked to disgregate at so many times in history um, the uh, the same um, I mean the Merovingians proved it in a sense the Carolingians too because um, the Capetians uh, for example the Western Frankish kingdom from the partitions of the Carolingian Empire was we say it often we will explain it at some point the least compact of all why because the, the work it was exactly the area where the greatest um, vassalatic clientels have been developed. So uh, it was lots of smaller dynasties that didn't quite want or have a specific necessity to, to have a king rise. Paradoxically, um, Burgundy, Italy, uh, even the Eastern Frankish Kingdom were more compact, right? Uh, and they had better chances of becoming unified countries. Instead, they wouldn't. They all failed, right? Uh, of the great chunks of you know of, of the you know Burgundy was aborted, uh, the Kingdom of Italy um, ke kept existing institutionally, but there was no unified power. The same goes for Germany. Um, France was the only one that, in, probably also due to the fact that it was very invested by by the Norse raids, etc. You know, maintained some mental hostilities that kept things together. The rise of the Capetians also happened very, very, very randomly because till the last they were challenged by other noblemen, etc. But gradually they made it in a sense. The Hundred Years' War was a dramatic moment. The wars of religion in France between the, the end of, of the 16th and the beginning of the 7th century were a mess. Um, the, uh, you see, uh, France is a massive system that goes up and down historically because it's a big thing and it does require this kind of leadership because it's it also has resources for it right it's not an asphytic a system that can be can require maybe a strong authority like i don't know russia because it's so diverse and big that it kind of needs the, that lack of democracy to, to function france is something that that is in the center of civilization and that is 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 an important thing. Whatever it does has unavoidably lots of enemies. It has unavoidably lots of pressure, and it has to re renovate such uh, internal um, capacity. For, well, you know, in Europe, they are the ones essentially have the bomb, 
right together with the British. And, well, because without France, we can hardly even think of a, of a European defense, right? Uh, we, we need that. And, and there is, um, and still, that also made a lot of things, like, because France is technically the ones that in the 50s made the project of a common European defense fail, because they wanted nationalistically to maintain their own control, and that ruined the party again for <laughs> everybody. But um, let's say that I, I person, I, I don't know. As a historian, at this point, I believe uh, that there is a connection. I don't want to sound uh, romantic, ethno-nationalistic, or whatever, but I do believe in the connection between the Merovingian dynasty and the identity of the French, of the French count, of the French, yeah, nationality. I would say like that. Um, and um, and I think that it is felt by the Fran by the French. I personally had very strong connections with you know since uh, ever since I was little with France, etc. And I um, I've met you know I've spent some also part of my sentimental life my by travel. It's, it's, it's the country I have been foreign country I've been the most in in my life, but like more than 15 or something like it, it, it's like a second home to me and I, and I have perceived like the, the French do reason like this I feel the the Merovingian pride the Merovingian uh, that that touch of that France is beautiful it, it has the touch of of barbarity and and and, and nobility and in and, in and, and grace at the same time it, it's it, it, it yeah you cannot but fall in love in a sense with France and I um, uh, I I see this connection. I see it. I've lived it. I've perceived it. You can see it in the people. You can see it in the air. You can see it in, the, in what they express themselves like. In what I see that connection. And I think that French history, by the way, is also brutally overlooked in popular culture. I must say this, that the French do not seem to like very much history. I don't know why. Uh, it's not like, I don't know, like the Germans that freak out because they, since for 12 years of Nazism, now that they, they cancelled all history from their horizon because they, they got paranoid, because they, they have been traumatized on purpose of for it. The, the, the French uh, see, in a sense, just themselves uh, in, a, in, in the world. So they don't need much to see things in historical perspective. And then, in fact, among my, my uh, audience, I have a very few French people. <laughs> I don't know why. I have a lot of uh, a lot of different. Mm, I don't know. I see. I have Germans, Italians, Scandinavians. Aside from, I mean, I'm speaking of course of the uh, Europeans now. It's true that maybe I haven't talked about France so much, but I see that the. I mean, considering the the mass of French population, or uh, it's it's ridiculously low from a statistical point of view, and I. I attribute it to that kind of spirit, that, uh, but uh, there would be a lot of things to say about this, and I I hope that I tried at least. This is the first time I get vocal about such um, connections, but um, I hope that at least this was kind of instructive for for as I as it was explaining at the beginning, I never made a video about the Merovingians in general, right? So now we will go further in depth, but at the moment I'm making lots of basic history videos because manuals sometimes are too dispersive. Um, more in-depth, uh, so, say, studies are somewhat too niche, so I need to make a lot of basics here. A lot of fundamentals that I had not done before and in the broader restructuring of the channel that I'm carrying out this may be useful also for attracting more you know general audience I think it can be a good starting point to begin with all right so for now I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested my uh, upcoming content and for now i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time bye